Facebook of Gregory Hood. Tonight, the story of the Free Silver Peso. Another exciting story from the casebook of Gregory Hood. It's Monday evening in San Francisco, and we have a date with Gregory Hood and his friend Sanderson Taylor. Our rendezvous tonight is at Gregory's apartment, high on Knob Hill and overlooking the San Francisco Bay. Let's keep our date, shall we? Good evening, Mr. Vatel. Hello, Kwong. Mr. Hood expecting you. Mr. Taylor, I've already arrived. Please to go in, sir. Thanks, Kwong. How are you? Hello, Sandy. Glad to see you. Ah, good evening, Harry. Good evening, Gregory. Oh, oh, please don't stop playing. That sounded swell. Oh, you like it? As this is our first appearance on the radio, I thought I'd whip up a little number in honor of the occasion. Oh? Other radio shows have a musical theme. I thought this might be appropriate for ours. <laughs> so as well as being the head of Gregory Hood and Company Importers and an amateur detective... You're also a composer, huh? In a very modest way, Harry. How about you, Sandy? I know that you're Mr. Hood's attorney as well as his closest friend. Uh, do you have any unusual talent you've been hiding under a bushel? <laughs> no, Harry. I, I'm a very dull dog compared to Gregory. I'm a good family man. I shoot an erratic game of golf, and I wield a writ of habeas corpus with uh, moderate dexterity. Ah, <laughs> uh, don't believe a word he says, Harry. Sandy has many hidden talents. The fact that you'll find out as tonight's story gets underway. Uh, would you care for a glass of sherry? Oh, that'd be very nice, Gregory. Uh, which particular page of the notebook have you decided to turn to for your first story? A page that has the heading, The Case of the Three Silver Pesos. Uh, we thought it was an adventure that would show you, Harry, that Gregory and I really don't go looking for trouble, <laughs> uh, though we do have an uncanny facility for meeting up with it. And uh, how did the three silver pesos catch up with you? Well, it was about six o'clock one evening a few weeks ago that Sandy and I started our drive across the Bay Bridge bound for Sandy's home in the Berkeley Hills. Little did we think that what promised to be an evening of pleasant domesticity was destined to turn into as wild and woolly an adventure. Bridge is beautiful in this line, isn't it, Gregory? Sunny. Just the same, I miss the ferry boat. Well, if you made the trip across as often as I do, you wouldn't. The bridge is not half an hour off the trip. Even so, I... Hey! Look at that car. Why doesn't he stay in his own lane? He's an oozer. They drive me crazy. What's an oozer? Plenty of them on the road. When they change lanes, they never give a signal. They just ooze. But still... Watch out, Gregory. He's weaving from side to side. Now he's pulling in toward the rail. He's going to stop. Yeah, but you're not allowed to stop on the bridge. He must be ill. I'm going to pull up behind him. Well, look, he, he's opened the car door. Well, he's staggering toward the parapet. This looks like a suicide attempt. Come on, Sandy. Get away from that parapet. Yes, 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 that's too high a jump for you, my friend. Sandy, help me hold him. Yes, right. There we are. Say, who are you? God. Gun. Yes, yes, a gun would be simpler. Come on, get in our car. We'll see you home. Gregory, I, I believe he's dead. Get into the car. Poor devil, I suppose his heart gave him his wish. And get into a doctor fast. We may be wrong. Oh, here comes a cop. Hey, you can't stop on the bridge. Just move him. Uh, we've got to get this man to a doctor officer. He's seriously ill. What about his car? Uh, you get his car cleared off the bridge, officer. We'll call back when we get to the Oakland side and make our report. Okay, get moving. Gregory, I, I'm sure of it. Did you find any identification on him? According to his wallet, his name is Harrison Travers. And he's from Los Angeles. Anything in his pocket? A package of Chesterfield, room key from the Hotel Barton. Oh, that's one of those flea dumps on Church Street. Huh? What else? Three silver pills. Oh, what is it? A small glass vial. It's empty. Uh, Gregory. Hmm? Smell it. Good Lord, cyanide. Do you suppose he swallowed it as he stepped out of the car? Could be. As soon as we get across the bridge, we'll stop at the nearest doctor's and find out. And 
That's our story, Dr. Arnold. And what explanation can you give, Doctor? So this is a fantastic case, gentlemen. You see that the man talked of a gun, carried an empty cyanide vial, tried to jump off the bridge, and apparently died of heart failure. That's right, Doctor. All very interesting, my friend. But this body happens to have been stabbed. Stabbed? What? He died from a sharp instrument piercing the chest near the heart. This gentleman is murdered. Back we head for the bridge to San Francisco with a corpse as a passenger. Hmm. Just at the time, we should be having a martini. Well, it's the only sensible thing to do, Gregory. The borderline between San Francisco and Alameda County runs right through the center of the bridge. The murder happened on the San Francisco side. Hmm. So we hand a nice new corpse over to Lieutenant Magruder of Homicide, who hates me and probably won't believe a word we say. Well, we can't take any chances, Gregory. We're mixed up in a murder case. True, true. But Magruder will probably say the guy was stabbed to death in my arms. I'll have a heck of a job proving he wasn't. Magruder'd love to put the finger on me. Now, Gregory, I'm not going to allow you to get mixed up in this any further. Ah, uh, but I am in it, Sandy. Up to my chin, I've got to follow through to spare myself. But Dr. Arnold made that stabbing business perfectly clear, Gregory. A man with such a wound might easily think it a mere scratch. He'd walk around for an hour before he drops dead. The police surgeon will understand. I hope so. Uh, did you call Mary? Yes, yes. I, I said we'd be back by 7.30. All right. I suppose you told her we just had to run a corpse back to the city. Yes. A wonderfully understanding girl, Mary. <laughs> when she knows I'm with you, Gregory, she's prepared for anything. <laughs> oh. Uh, why are we stopping? Don't you see the damsel in distress teetering on the curb ahead of us? Mm, damsel, nothing. Damsels don't come ride. Oh, you must guard against being snobbish, then. Well, in any case, we've got a talk in the rear. Oh, we'll say he's a bit under the weather. Um, hop in, young lady. There's room for three in front. Oh, well, where are we? I was beginning to think you'd never come along. Sam, I'm Penelope. Penny's the story. My name's Taylor, and mine's Hood. What's wrong with your friend in the box? Him? Uh-huh. Oh, uh, he doesn't feel very well. Uh, still, huh? Oh, well, it's happened before. Uh, don't you think it's a little dangerous for young girls to hitch rides across the bridge? Don't worry, Mr. Penny can take care of herself. I had a date at 7.15, and I just missed the train. I didn't want to wait. Well, I'm sure you didn't have to wait long for a ride. Mm, I didn't, but I'm choosy. Too many lone wolves on wheels. And when we slowed down, Penny, I suppose the natural honesty of our expressions decided you that you'd be safe with us. <laughs> Say, you're pretty smooth. What's your other name, Mr. Hood? Gregory. I don't know how safe a girl would be with you, Gregory. But I bet you sure a good time. Uh, I am reputed to have my moments, Penny. Uh, Gregory, don't you think it was uh, Mr. Travers in the bank at Oh, my what happened, Betty? Oh, it's Law. Please stop and let me out. It's brand new. Oh, that's the trouble with these modern hats. They have no stamina. I'll go back and get it for you. Uh, watch the traffic, Gregory. Don't get out that time. Oh, don't worry, Sandy. I never commit suicide on Monday. You climb out this way. I'll get out. Oh, move over a little bit. There we are. That'll do. Thank you. I'll be back in a jiffy. Mm, your friend Mike. What does he do? Do? Mm -hmm. Why, uh, he's in the importing business. Oh, uh, sounds so. Oh, look. Mm -hmm. Up there. Isn't that the Honolulu Clipper coming in? Uh, I don't see it. Goodbye, sucker. What? What happened? Penny stole our car. And our course. Sandy, Lieutenant Magruder's never going to believe this one. And that's our story, Lieutenant Magruder. And you're expecting me to believe it, I suppose. What did I tell you, Sandy? Listen, Mr. Hood, you're in the importing business. I keep my nose out of that kind of stuff. Why do you mix yourself up with a homicide case? I didn't, Magruder. It mixed itself up with me. Yeah, don't give me that. You think you're a hot shot detective. You're the smart boy who's always trying to show us up as a bunch of flatfoot. Don't waste my time. Magruder, the San Francisco police force is one of the finest in the country. Why do you have to spoil the rest of What do I have to do to make you realize there's been a murder? Show me a murdered man. But we had him. His corpse was in the stolen car. Sure, sure. And before he was stiff, you thought he was going to jump off the bridge. Then he had a heart attack. Then he was going to shoot himself. Then that he's poisoned himself. And finally, a doctor told you he'd been nice. You had to cap it all off a blonde babe, steals your car, and your car. Who are you trying to kid? Well, I admit that it sounds unlikely, but it's true, Magruder. Prove it. 
Well, how about the traffic cop who came up to us on the bridge? Yes. He drove the dead man's car way ahead of us. He must have sent in a report. Must he now? Well, I've checked the records, and there hasn't been a traffic report from the Bay Bridge since 4 o'clock. Now, what do you say, Mr. Hood? That I'll prove it to you. Come on, Sandy. Come back on Saturday, Mr. Hood. It's my day off. Uh, you see how much your law-abiding instincts do for us, Sandy? Magruder doesn't believe us. And see what your chivalrous instincts did for us. Your damsel in distress runs off with your car and the evidence. Now we've got to follow this thing through to prove to Magruder that we're not nuts. You better call Mary and tell her it'll have to be a midnight snack. Uh, okay, Gregory, but I don't see where we go from here. Luckily, I kept these three objects that were in the dead man's pocket. They're the only clues we've got. Uh, a hotel key, an empty vial, and three silver pesos. Yes. Yeah. Let's take the key first. Hotel Barton, room 207. All right, Sandy, that's our first port of call. What a ghastly dump, Gregory. But as you see, service with an alleged smile. Oh, good evening. Well, Paul. I'm so glad. I hope you stay that way. What do you want? To see Mr. Harrison Travers. No Travers here. Number one. But this key... 207. Good. Glad to have it back. Stolen from us months ago. Thanks. Fine. Uh, who's living in that room? I am. Good night. You know, Gregory, I, uh, I'm beginning to think that Magruder was right. And that this whole business didn't happen after all. And I'm getting as obstinate as all get out. I didn't believe that hotel clerk, but I couldn't search the room without a police warrant. And with Magruder in his present frame of mind, that wouldn't be the easiest thing to get. <laughs> uh, where are we headed for now? The shop of my old friend Goldwasser. Long here somewhere. Well, how can he help us? He's a coin dealer, the best in San Francisco. I want to ask him about these three silver pesos. Ah, here's the shop. Hello, Henry. Gregory Hood, my dear boy. How good to see you. Hello, this is Mr. Sanderson Taylor. How do you do? Mr. Goldwasser? Come. Let's go into my room at the back. We can sit down and be comfortable there. How have you been, Henry? Fine, Gregory. Fine. Huh? Oh, it's a better for seeing you after this long time. So, sit down. Ah, this is a very special occasion. Perhaps you will join me in a little glass of port, my friend. Hey, wonderful idea. Uh, Heinrich, we're in something of a jam. I'm hoping you can help us. Oh? Oh, we shall see what we can do. Say, Gregory. Oh, Mr. You. Taylor? Thank you. Now, Gregory, tell me how I may help you. Heinrich, I want you to look at these silver pesos. Ah. Is there anything odd or rare about them? Or uh, any way we could trace their ownership? None. Well, commonly not coins, and yet I have many such duplicate coins here. I will check this for weight. I will put one of your coins on the scale, though. And on the other scale, I will put one of my duplicate coins. But I know the beginning, though. And what did you find? The coin I gave you is much lighter. It must be counterfeit. No, I do not think so. Let me look at it through my glass. Oh, very ingenious. What is it, Ernest? This coin on its coat. The hollow section inside, though. There's a white powder inside. Dope. At last, we know what we're up against. May I use your telephone, Henry? Oh, of course, my friend. So, we are mixed up with a dope ring, Gregory. No doubt about it, Sandy. Now, perhaps I can make Magruder nibble a little humble pie. Please, Ed Quarters. I'm Lieutenant speaking. Uh, this is Gregory Hood. It is, huh? Where are you? Goldwasser's coin shop on market. I've got some news for you, McGregor. And I've got some for you. We found your car deserted on Turk Street. With a corpse in it? Sure. Good. Then now perhaps you believe the story. Only it wasn't the corpse you described. It was a nice, fresh corpse by the name of Penelope. Penny? Dead? Stay where you are, Hood. I'll be right over to arrest you on suspicion of murder. You'll hear the rest of tonight's story from the casebook of Gregory Hood in just a second. Well, Sandy, you certainly were in up to your ears that time. 
I, I guess you were able to talk yourself out of it. With Magruder? <laughs> no, Harry, the more eloquent Gregory became, the more suspicious it seemed to make Magruder. And I couldn't do anything to prevent Magruder booking him on suspicion of murder. <laughs> you mean to say you were actually locked up? Yes, Harry. I landed in the <laughs> jug with a resounding splash at just about the time a civilized man is warming his cockles with a good brandy. Sandy scurried off to get rid of habeas corpus, but for nearly an hour I found myself in a cell adjoining a certain unhappy character named Joe. <laughs> Poor Joe. I don't think he knew what to make of me. I'm Joe. Joe the Tipper. Hi, Joe. Hey, what's your handle, Matt? Sam. Sam McGee. You look slick. You want a Charlie's mob? No, work I'm on. And what the pinch you for, Sam? The words sliced up my mall. You kidding? Kidding? You're talking to Sammy the Slicer. I ought to see what I did to Fanny. Cut her in 19 pieces. A surgeon couldn't have done a better job. Not as neat a slicing as I did on Aunt Agatha, though. Ah, uh, I can still see her expression as I cut her head off. Look, I'm just a small time crab man. They shouldn't ought to put me next to you. Hey, Charlie, hey, let me out of here. Hey, off it, Joe. I'm going to spring you. I'm going to spring both of us. I don't want to go nowhere with you. Hey, Charlie! Hide down, Joe. I've got a pineapple in my pocket. I'm going to toss it out there in the aisle and blow this coop sky high. Don't do it. Hey, Charlie, come here. Sam, the flag is going to make a break. Get me away from him, will you? I stand in my constitutional right. A guy's got a right to be locked up nice and quiet. Ah, uh, face down, Joe. Your attorney's here, Mr. Hood. Oh. I'm sorry it took so long, Gregory. Come on. Oh, it's a cozy little cell, but I don't want to overstay my welcome. Oh, uh, so long, Joe. You search him. The guy's a killer, and he's got a pineapple on him. Don't bother you, Mr. Hood. No, no. But he's got the gall down, just imagination. Uh, did you get the car back, Sandy? No. Still being held as evidence. Then we must grab a cab as fast as we can. There's a lot of unfinished business ahead of us. Do, Mag. Fisherman's Walk. Okay. Oh, why Fisherman's Walk, Gregory? I just put in a call to Herb Kane of the San Francisco Chronicle. He tells me there's a film company shooting night location there. Uh, how does a film company tie in with our little headache? It's simple. I'm looking for an act. Now, what's playing at the Geary Theater? A drawing room comedy. Yes, and there's a costume musical at the current. Correct. The stage show at the Golden Gate is a dance band and singers, no actors, so that's out. Therefore, a film company. Get it? Absolutely and unequivocally... No. Very well. Let's work the case out backwards. Oh, that'll be a great help. Why not sideways? Maybe my recent incarceration has made me a little stir-crazy. Tell me how you figured the thing out so far, Sandy. Well, obviously Travers, the man we found on the bridge, was mixed up with a dope gang and was probably killed in some uh, internal quarrel. And exhibit number two, the late Penelope, where did she fit in? Oh, I don't think that's a hard one. She was a member of the ring. They stationed her near the entrance to the bridge, knowing that a man of your notorious susceptibilities would be bound to pick her up. Oh, indeed. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. And then she stole the corpse. The hotel clerk was bribed to deny the murdered man's existence. And later they killed the girl to make things safer. Uh, or maybe she wanted too much of a cut. Sandy, you're excelling yourself. <laughs> Elementary, my dear Gregory. But uh, I... Still don't see where an actor enters the picture. But surely you see who the killer is now, don't you? Well, I, <laughs> I've read enough mystery stories to know that it must be the LSP, the least suspected person. You have that uh, LSP tone in your voice, Gregory. But uh, we haven't met any LSPs, uh, unless it's Goldwater or, or Doctor Arnold. Uh -uh. Remember, Sandy, the original bridge episode was never reported, nor was Travis' car turned in. Magruder told us that. So the traffic cop to whom we turned over Travis' car was a phony? And our killer, probably. He was tailing Travis to make sure he died. Which he did. But uh, we got away with the corpse. So he phoned for Penelope across the bay to stop us on the approach to the bridge on the way back. Now, who could, at a moment's notice, outfit himself as a traffic cop for shadowing purposes? I get it, Gregory. An actor. Right. An actor having a uniform for such a role. Here you are, Max. Fisherman's Wharf. Fine. Wait here for us, driver. We won't be a minute. Okay. Come on, Sandy. <laughs> hey, look at the crowds, Gregory. Oh, it's not surprising. Hollywood's putting on a free outdoor floor show. You can't come any farther. Sorry. Oh, uh, who's the director on this picture? Oh, Chester Garland. I'm Bud Denton, second assistant. Can I help you? I hope so. You have an actor in this production who's playing a traffic cop? Yeah, funny you should ask that. 
He's been missing all day, so does his motorcycle. And no answer from his hotel, either. Uh, do you happen to remember the name of his hotel? Yeah. Hotel Barton on Turk Street. And his name? Gunn. Fred Gunn. Fred Gunn. Much obliged to you. Come on, Sandy. You're welcome. Now, it's clear, Sandy. The dying man's words meant not a weapon, but a name. What? Fred Gunn. Let's skip back into our cab and go back to the Hotel Barton and visit with him. When I tell you there's no Fred Gunn been living here. And I tell you that he's still living in 207. Give us a fast key. Are you caught? No, but we're sending for them in a few minutes. You might as well keep yourself out of a bad mess. Here. Here's the pass cake. And don't tie me up in anything. I just did what I was told. And what were you told, my friend? To say that I was living in 207. I didn't see any harm in that. We we don't ask too many questions here. Is Fred Gunn in his room now? Yeah, it came in an hour ago with some drunken bum that couldn't stand up. They were plastered as hootie owls. Let's go, Sandy. Right. Might as well walk up. It's only the second floor. I suppose if I were in this game professionally, I'd be carrying a gun, Sandy. Uh, I'd feel safer if you were, Gregory. Looks as if we've got a killer cornered in a rat hole. He might shoot before he asks questions, you know. Sandy. Eh? I don't want to be melodramatic, but you've got a wife and two children. I, I wish you'd go back and wait for me in the lobby. Nice of you, Gregory. But this is Hood Company business. In any case, I, I don't want to miss the fun. You're a remarkably square man, Sandy. There are times when I'm quite fond of you. Yeah. Here we are. Two hundred and seven. Going to knock? Uh-uh. Our only chance is to rush him. Hope the door isn't locked. Watch out, then. Yep. Done. Done. He's asleep on the bed. Take it easy, Gregory. We can tie him with the bedclothes. He doesn't need bedclothes, Sandy. He needs a shroud. He's dead. Smell this bottle of whiskey. It's been spiked with cyanide. Great Scott. Gregory, look. They're on the floor. The now familiar corpse of Mr. Travers. How it does get around. Oh, we're in a serious jam now, Gregory. Knee deep in corpses and not a single suspect left. We don't need one. I know who murdered Gunn, and uh, oddly enough, he's in the room now. The killer? Where? In the closet? Uh, closer than that, Sandy. Oh, now look, Gregory. If you're going to put the finger on me as the least suspected person, it's going too far. I won't stand for it. No, no, Sandy. Mr. Travers lying on the floor is the latest killer. But you, 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 you mean that the corpse is the murderer? Sure. Remember the empty cyanide vial? Before Travers was killed himself, he'd poisoned Gunn's whiskey. Gunn figured he'd stay sober until he'd retrieved Travers' corpse. He brought it back here, started to figure out how he was going to dispose of it. Exactly. He decided to take a slug of whiskey to help his thinking machinery, and so he died. Murdered by his own victim. Oh, I see. And now I have a call to make. Elmwood 6, 4222. Calling Lieutenant Magruder? Sure. This is going to be fun. <laughs> uh, Magruder in homicide, please. Uh, after you're through, Gregory, I'll call Mary. We'll have one of her delicious rabbits, and you'll stay the night. It's a date. Uh, Magruder? This is Gregory Hood. Now, settle back in your chair and make yourself comfortable, because I've got a fairy story to tell you. Once upon a time, a couple of worthy citizens were driving across the Bay Bridge when the car in front of them started to weave. You will never believe this, Magruder, but as... Well, Gregory, that was a swell story. Very different, too. Yes, and I might say it almost marked the end of my beautiful friendship with Magruder. <laughs> that was quite a twist, Gregory, the murderer being murdered by his victim. And I'd like to point out a moral, uh, if you'll pardon my pointing. Oh, go right ahead. The story proves that you get what you give. <laughs> and fortunately, that works for the best, too. Ah, quite a philosopher, aren't you? Just what you mean. Well, we all get what we give. Look, when you drop by my house, what do I get? A warm welcome. And? Um, a good dinner. And? Well, Gregory, to what page of your casebook are you turning next Monday? Next Monday, Harry, I'm going to tell you an odd story that concerns a San Francisco cable car, a rather unusual brunette, and a blood-stained hatchet. I call it the Black Museum. See you next Monday, Harry. The 
Casebook of Gregory Hood is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher. Original music is composed and played by Dean Foster. Mr. Gail Gordon plays the part of Gregory Hood, and Sanderson Taylor is played by Mr. Bill Johnstone. The Casebook of Gregory Hood comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.